All right, so I'm recording there. That should be all set. Okay, so here we go. Oh, okay, yes, the wine bottle is already uncorked, and we are going to drink. All right, so um, I got a bottle of Merlot. It's, made, it's, it's called Emelo, and it's a sister company of Cake Bread. And uh, we're going to use that to drink. And we're also going to use it to um, season the meat. There you go. Got it? Okay. Ladies first. Alright, so it's a, it's a Merlot. I think Cabot is a little too strong. Cheers. Okay, so... Ching ching. Alright, so today... Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to make some cup of cola. It's, it's a lot easier than a, a ground product because it's a whole muscle. So uh, what I did two weeks ago is I ordered the copa mussels. And I remember uh, when my grandfather used to make them, they used to be very, very large like this. So I called a bunch of butchers. I called packing companies, everything. And I says, I'm looking for the copa mussel like this. And they go, no, no, they don't make it like that anymore. And so most of them are coming in about 1,300 to 1,700 grams, about this size. Um, so I was wondering why. I mean, pigs didn't get any smaller. So, but although they do butcher pigs right now around here at about uh, eight months to 10 months old, uh, 180 to 240 pounds. Um, anything longer than that, it actually costs them more to feed the animal than it does uh, on what they're going to yield back in meat. So about 180 to 240 pounds is the average butchered commercial pig. So I asked them why these cup of colas are not coming in as large as I remember. And the reason is is because most butchers now, the way they're butchering the, the pig, is they butcher it in what they call a North American prime cut. So the North American prime cut, they, they take the body and they cut it this way, they cut it this way, so they end up with a center. Uh, a center. Am I chopping off? Well, then move the tripod. Back? No, just bring it up or down. Use the handle. There you go. Better? Yeah. Okay, so on a North American butcher cut, they normally, um, they, they, they cut it down the center so they have the, the shoulder and the, the picnic, uh, picnic, whatever they call it over here, and then they have the hind end, and then they have the center section. So the reason why they do that is because they yield more money on the meat than the cuts that we actually want to do for curing. So that's why the copa mussel is actually cut shorter than it normally is. So um, the only other way I'm going to get the larger cut is if you order a whole pig or a half a pig, then you can butcher it any which way you want to get the length of cuts that you want. Um, Whereas the way they do it now, you'd actually be cutting into the loin, and the loin yields more money. So that's why they don't do it that way. So here's the trick, and here's the difference, a lot different than the old way of cup of cola. The old way, they would take the whole muscle, and they would uh, throw it in a box, and they would cover it with salt. And that's called the salt box method. And they would keep it in that salt for X period of time. I don't know exactly what it was. Um, and then after that, they would start the process that I'm going to show you today. And they would do the same thing with prosciuttos and everything else. This is a lot different, and this is called an EQ method. The EQ method, or the equalized method, is that we take the copa muscle, and we weigh it, and we add 2% sea salt. Coarse sea salt or kosher salt. And so now... We sprinkle the 2% kosher sea salt on this meat, and we can also season it. So this one here is also seasoned in a crushed red pepper. And I also used one quarter of 1% of cure number two, which is a sodium nitrate. The sodium nitrate is not as critical on whole muscles as it is ground product, but it is a safety factor, so I still put it in this. Now, the EQ method is, is once you sprinkle this whole thing with 2%, uh, sea salt and whatever you want to coat it with then you vacuum pack it and it's got to be vacuum packed it should be free of air and these go in the refrigerator um, 
because of the diameter of the meat, um, a good rule of thumb is about two weeks in a standard refrigerator. And what that will do is the salt will start pulling the liquid out of the meat and create like a salt brine. And then as the water goes back into the meat, it's actually brining the meat and that's your curing process. The benefit of doing it this way is from one cut to the next depending on how much fat you have, how much fat you don't have. With a salt box method you never know how much salt is actually penetrating the meat. So then you hang these and you dry them and you cure them and you go through all of this and then you slice them and when you slice them they go, oh, this one's too salty. Or they didn't salt box it long enough and the center is still brown which means it never got cured properly. So every cut of meat will take salt differently so the salt box method you're guessing even when you make prosciutto you're guessing on how much salt you're really going to end up with when you do a salt box method and how salty the product's going to come. On this particular situation you're giving the meat 2% and we know that based on the thickness of the meat it's going to sit in the refrigerator for two weeks and uh, and we know that at any given time this meat will never get saltier than two percent salt that's it okay um, so we are vacuum packed now I took some and I rolled them in crushed red pepper and I took some and I rolled them in black pepper and the next thing we're going to do is we're going to rinse them and then we're going to give them a rinse through red wine and then we're going to re-roll them in a crushed red pepper and then we're going to stuff them into a beef bung and net them and once we net them then we're going to hang them in the chamber at 50 degrees at 70 percent 75 percent humidity until we lose at least 35 percent weight so after we put these in the beef bung and tie them we will weigh them and we'll we'll throw a tag on them and once we lose 35%, these are ready to eat. Um, I normally take them to 42, 43% because I like them a little firm. So the finished product. So this was made, um, and I don't know how close I need to get here because I can't see the monitor. It's good. It's good. Is this good? So this is a cup of cola. That's uh, it's just a, a dissected section of a, a finished product. And this one was made, uh, and it's and it's wrapped in black pepper. And you can see that whatever spices you put on it never penetrates the meat. So when you see cup of cola in the store and it's all red on the inside and all that, that's not a true real cup of cola. So the only spice you're going to get out of this is whatever spice you put on the outside. It doesn't really penetrate the meat that much. So that's why you have to hit them pretty hard just to get some kind of spice out of them. Um, <clears throat> this, was, uh, this was dried to about 43%. And, uh, and it slices like so. This is a slice. I'll put a slice up here. There we go. I got two cameras going, so I don't know what's that other one doing over there. Can't tell. It doesn't have a feedback. Oh, this is it. How's that one? Good. Okay, good. And your head's cut off. And there's your sliced cup of cola. Okay. Pull it up. Yeah, there you go. Pull the camera up if you need to or whatever. This is a sliced cup of cola. Um, this was made in March of this year. And then once they're done, I vacuum pack them and I put them in the refrigerator. And they re, if there's a little dryness on the outside, um, they will re-equalize or the dryness on the outside will, will penetrate the center and the center will get a little uh, less soft and re-equalize. So you'll see that there's zero dry rim around the outside of this piece of meat. And uh, this is, uh, melts in your mouth. It's, um, it's really, really good. Um, I never liked cup of cola when I was younger, and it's not as um, it's not as pungent flavor as a prosciutto, but uh, on a sandwich they uh, they go really good. There you go. So I would offer one to my wife, but she's a vegetarian, so I get to eat it all today. So I was going to have a helper today, and he didn't make it. So this is ad lib. But I think what we'll do is we'll take you through the process on one. No use running the video for nine pieces that I have here because the process is the same. So we're ready to roll. So first thing I'm going to do 
Here's one that was uh, rolled in red pepper. And again, this went in, this is 1,640 grams when it went in. We don't need to weigh it yet. We'll take this out, pop it out, and you'll see how red this got. Now the red is not always just the straight, uh, there's a lot of red pepper on here, but the red is also because of the curing process. And you'll notice that there's zero gray on the outside whatsoever. So I'm going to take this uh, right now. Do we have another uh, another bin? Uh, let me grab, you know what? Can you do me a favor? Grab the paper towels, I think, that are on the table over there. I wasn't planning on doing it this way, but I think I'm going to do it this way. Guess I'm not you. Just, yeah, just let me get my hands wiped. Good. Okay, so uh, let's see. I tried to prepare so this went nice and smooth. Oh, we have more <laughs> more meat down there. A hidden gem. All right, so I don't know if that camera's straight and whether you can see all this or not. You can see that. Yeah. That one's good. I'll push it down just a little. There you go. Put your head. Yeah. Now I gotta. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. And how's that one? That one's good. Mm, let me check this one. Yeah. Oh yeah, this one. Okay. Any questions so far, guys? Okay. Okay. So, we're going to take these eight pieces of meat and put them over here for now. And we'll start with just one. Here's my container. Wide. Red wide. Bingo. Save that for me. So here's the red Capricola that was done in uh, red pepper. I'll be right back. I'm going to rinse it. So, here is the piece of meat rinsed. So we're, we're good there. Everything's nice and red. Again, no gray areas whatsoever. It cured uh, really well. And uh, I'm going to give that a, a, a drizzle uh, into the red wine. And let it sit there for a couple minutes. Any questions so far? Anybody talking? Nick, how are you? No, it's not storming here. Uh, we went, Tommy, how you doing? Um, hey. It's not storming. We uh, they they warned us that the storm was coming through, and uh, this time they were correct. It came through with some pretty heavy winds. That was roughly one thirty, mm -hmm. one thirty Chicago time. And uh, is it raining anymore? Might yes, be rain, it might be raining a little now, but no, the thunderstorms are completely gone. No, there's gone. thunder going on. Huh? Thunder was going on. We have thunder too? Just a minute ago. Oh, okay. Then yeah, maybe we still have a little thunder. All right, so, I don't know if you guys can see all this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Dang. So here's, here's red pepper. Yes. There we go. Okay. I don't know. <coughs> All right, we'll move this out of the way. I'm going to try to do this one person. And, uh... There you go. All right, so... We uh, drizzled it in wine. Pouring in Round Lake. It's pouring in Round Lake, my wife said. Mm. How do you know? 
Because Larry told me that. Okay. And there we are in red wine. Bosco's barking upstairs. Mickey smells the meat. All right, voila. So this was about 1,600 grams. They're, they came out really small this time, considering that you're gonna lose about uh, 40%. All right, there we go. Can you see it in the video? Yes. Okay, give this a nice roll in red pepper. Again, it looks like a lot. I'm not a, I'm not a person that's into really hot spices. And when all is said and done, this is really not that hot. It's kind of messy, but oh well, what are you going to do? Pepper flakes. Pe pe pepper flakes. Just give me the other one, please. Just give me the other one. That one right there. Oh, I do. Okay. So, we're going to take this one, we're going to roll this in red pepper. Try to make this uh, easy and quick. Okay, because we have nine to do, but I'll show you how we do one, and then after that, it's just rinse and repeat. <laughs> All right, so these are these are beef buns. Everybody in my family says they're grouse. They kind of are. That's it. What spices are in the sweet? In the what? What spices are in the sweet? Sweet what? I don't know. That's all the question is. There is no sweet. Um, you don't have to put any spices in. Some people use uh, juniper berries. Um, some people use black pepper and red pepper. Uh, I'm, 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 we're making a, a, a straight red this time. Um, there are some people that also, uh, after they cured and dried, there are some people that will then give them another layer of flavor. Okay, so this is a beef bong. They're roughly five and a half inches in diameter. They're really fun. They're kind of a pain. One part is getting them on there, and I found this is to be the easiest way. It's still messy, but camera got a view of this. Yes. Okay. Yes, and yes. My daughter's freaking out. Jess is like, Jess is like, ew, ew. Okay. So, and again, they get a little messy, but what are you going to do? We'll rinse them afterwards. All right, this is all the way down to the bottom now. So I took the beef bung because they're so small, um, because the, the meat is so small, you can actually get two cup of colas out of, out of one beef bung feel like I have peppered all over the place. Alright, so give this a tie. off like that. Okay. 
I'll be back. I'm going to go give this outside a rinse, and then I'll show you the next thing I do. I have a question. Yes. What would you use on a big slabs, or what did your grandpa use? They used beef bones, and they used black pepper and red pepper, but they were a lot larger. They were almost double the length, so you could get one copa and one whole beef bone. So I cut this one in half. This is a half a beef bone, and this is rinsed. Gabagool, according to uh, Tony Soprano. So, but this is this is really what it is. All right, so. That's all set. Then I'm going to take a netter. Now you can hand tie these if you want them to look uh, really nice and pretty. I'll uh, post some pictures of hand tied, um, which, which you can do. It's no problem. Um, but these days you really don't have to hand tie. He anymore. means the casing. The casing is a beef bun. And that's what your grandpa used to use. Yes, they used to use they used to use five and a half inch. Uh, beef bungs is what they call them and those beef bungs will hold uh, uh, 11 pounds easily uh, they make them in a bunch of different diameters um, yeah in those days they didn't have like collagen sheets and uh, you know fibrous all the uh, un, uh, fake casings they were all real real casings so I'm tying the end of this uh, netting and getting this prepared and there we go this is a funnel and it's expandable so just go like this like that take this pop it into the funnel can you see on the video there yes mm -hmm. pop it into the funnel keep a lot of pressure on the netting and how cool is that there it is. Cut the netting. And it's netted. That's it. So, you can see it? Mm -hmm. It's netted. And it acts like a Chinese finger locks. So, as, uh, as the meat shrinks, uh, the netting will shrink with it. And the benefit of the netting is it, uh, it keeps the casings bound to the meat which gives you uh, less air pockets uh, between the casing and the meat which is uh, which is better. What rule or role will the blotter be playing in this preparation? Okay so if you don't do this uh, they have a tendency to um, the, the meat will dry faster and if the, if, the, if, the, if the meat dries faster you'll get what they call hard rim and if the if the meat dries too fast on the outside um, which is the reason why you keep your humidity up also um, but if it dries too fast and the center does not dry then the center has no way for the uh, to the, it has no way for the moisture to escape from the center of the meat so that's why you keep the humidity up because it's a very slow drying process. If the, hard, if the outside gets hard and dry too fast, the center stays soft, you're ruined. You're done. The center will never dry properly and you're done. And how long does it usually take the meat to dry out? 35-40% um, based on this size they'll probably be about three months at the temperature that I'm running them at, which is about 50 degrees. Um, the colder you go, the longer the process. Uh, the longer the process, a lot of people say the more flavor. You poke the casing like in a super sada? Um, good. I'm glad you asked because bingo, bingo, poker. Next, next step. Yeah. 
It's looking great, this video you're doing. Who said that? Michael. Michael. I'm making this one a lot faster. I'm not going to run it to show you nine of them. Um, I don't think there's any reason to because the process is much easier than a, um, than a ground product. Ground product is grinding and weighing and all that other fun stuff and it's, it, it's a process. Clean up on this is a couple of trays, uh, making, making them, you know, um, I'm making nine of them so let's call it roughly 40 pounds, it'll yield 20 pounds of meat. It took me roughly a half hour or 45 minutes to salt them and bag them two weeks ago. And I'll spend about another hour um, to get all nine of them uh, into this condition. And there it is. So the next thing I'll do now is uh, just weigh it. And uh, which I forgot to do. So we'll just move the beef bongs over here. Turn on the scale. Do you use the wine to hold the spices? No, wine is just another layer of flavor. Uh, you don't need to use wine at all. You could have just rinsed it. Um, as long as you get that spice onto the meat and it's holding with something. Uh, it, it, one, once it's in the casing, it really has nowhere to go anyway. It's going to bond to the meat. Um, so, wine, some people use vinegar. Um, I don't use vinegar. So, uh, so you would say that uh, it's like 15 to $20 a pound when you're done? Um, in the store? Well, of course. Because, I mean, basically, uh, copa mussels are about about $2, 209 a pound, but you lose 40%, so let's call it 50%. Um, so you're at $4 a pound cost. Salt, eh, no big deal. Red pepper, eh, no big deal. Um, uh, netting, okay, it's an expense. Um, and then you have the beef bungs, which are about 5 or $6 a piece, so call that $3 a piece um, if you're doing halvesies like this. So $3 a piece for a beef bung. Uh, this is, you know, so, you know, you're, you're still coming up on, out less than, uh, uh, less than five or six dollars a pound. But you can't find it in a regular store. That's why you, you don't, you don't make this stuff because you're saving money. You're, you're making this stuff because this is the old classic way that you know, you go, oh man, you know, stuff doesn't taste like it used to, and that's because it's not made like it used to. And so, this is the old classic way in, in making this stuff. So, this is 1,805 grams. It started at 1,640, so that's kind of weird. That means that it, it uh, yeah, well, I don't know, we got 100 grams of red pepper on there plus the casing. So, we really didn't lose any weight of the meat during the curing process in the vacuum. So, uh, very important, when you do the EQ method by salting um, with the 2% salt or 2.25%, whatever, 2% is good, don't go less than 2%, uh, but when you do that, it's very important that you vacuum pack that meat. When you hang the cup of colors, do you treat the skin with oil or anything? Zero, nothing, nothing. There's a, there's a natural white mold um, that's growing in the curing chamber. So the curing chamber is already inoculated with good mold. Uh, good mold is based on the humidity that you're running in there. Um, if you start getting a different color mold, it doesn't necessarily make it bad, although some people look at it and think it's bad. Um, you just see when you see a different color pop up or whatever, um, if you don't want it in there, you can just wipe it down a little with uh, uh, a little vinegar or whatever and just take the, if, if you have a little uh, green or turquoise, but it's not furry mold, it's a chalky mold. Furry means that it's just getting to be the wrong kind of mold. Again, if it's black mold, that's a red flag. But any of the other ones, it's normally the difference between your humidity being off like 
three or four percent too high or three or four percent too low. That white stuff is it, it will coat this. Um, there is a benefit to that. Um, it, it, I, I don't say that it really changes the flavor whatsoever, um, but the biggest benefit with the mold is in the olden days when they were curing like this, it would keep the critters away from the meat. So um, uh, that's that's primarily what the meat. It, it, it's it's a protector of of the meat to keep any critters, flies, any of that away from the meat. Now in this situation we're hanging this in a, in a full sealed stainless steel um, modified refrigerator so there are no critters. Uh, it's, a, it's a very very clean environment. So, um, But the mold is definitely a protector and helps and that again also helps on the drying process of not making this dry too fast. Um, if you if you increase the humidity to so it doesn't dry as fast that's when you start growing different molds so the best way to maintain your uh, humidity levels and your drying time is uh, is by temperature and by casing and by molds so that's really kind of what I've been told um, and it works. It works really, really well. So, 1,805 grams. That's the finished product. I have eight more to go. So the next thing I'll do is, um, I'll be right back. I forgot to put this on before the knot. There's some What's that? I'll see if I can get this on. There we go. That's good. Okay, so this one is 1,805 grams. 1,805. Some take. Some people take the 1,805. They take the 45, 40 percent weight loss off now and they put that number on this tag so when you occasionally weigh them you know your target. I, I don't do that, I just take a calcula calculator out when I weigh them whenever I decide to. And today is uh, June 30th, 2019, right? Mm -hmm. And this had a red pepper, so I'm going to put RP. Uh, this had a red pepper layer in the curing process and then we doubled up and red peppered again uh, before we cased it. So, at this point, this is ready to rock and roll. There you go. 1805 grams on 630, 2019. Red pepper on red pepper. That's it. And I have some here that are black pepper. Um, they were coated in black pepper instead of red pepper. Um, and I don't know, maybe I'll just do red pep uh, black pepper, red pepper. And maybe I'll do red pepper across all of them. Um, the one that I had here, the one that I've been eating, is very good, but it's very, very, very mild. You can't even taste the black pepper. So this was black pepper on black pepper, and you can barely taste the black pepper. So I'm looking for something with a little more heat this time, because this has zero heat, even though it's coated as much as it is. There is zero heat going on uh, with this guy. Um, there are people that after it dries, before they vacuum pack it and put it in the refrigerator, they'll give it another layer of flavor. They'll dip it in brandy, brandy infused with uh, juniper berries, uh, another layer of pulverized red pepper. Um, some people go pepper crazy. Uh, ghost peppers, whatever, if you really want some serious heat. Uh, you can do a jalapeno, whatever. Eh, you know what. I'm, I'm, but I'm, you usually don't put any more spices in once no, you vacuum pack it. I, I don't. Once, once this is done, this is all the flavor it's going to get. And I'll vacuum pack it and then put it in a standard refrigerator. I'll, once it's done, I'll cut it into maybe um, three sections and vacuum pack three sections individually. 
which are kind of like that's one section of three, let's call it. And you'll see how much they really shrink. But you'll see the marbling on that. Can you see that? Marbling is fantastic. Um, but this is about the size they'll get. That's it. That's it. And so when I want to take it out or whatever, I'll pull a small piece out like this. I'll bring down the slicer, slice it real thin, take 10, 15 slices off of it, whatever. And then I'll take this and I'll revacuum pack it um, and put it back in the refrigerator. Um, I have some in the refrigerator that are two and a half and three years old. And so in time, they, they continue to, like wine, as they get older in that, in that vacuum seal, they really do add more flavor even if you don't give it another layer of flavor. And the temperature and humidity in the chamber is? Um, anywhere from 47 to 52 degrees. Um, I, although I do know some people on some of the groups that uh, dry um, at, at 32 and 34 degrees. Um, which is really, really, really cold, and they take forever when you do that. Um, typical cantinas and uh, and cellars were, you know, in the 50 degree range. I probably wouldn't go any higher than 55 degrees. Um, although I went to uh, the Bronx last year and went to a store called the Calabria Pork Shop, and when you walk in, I swear to God, the whole ceiling. The super sabas were all hanging from the ceiling, right in the store, and they had some fans on the floor, just kind of blowing up, you know, just kind of, you know, little wispy fans, and they were all just growing on the ceiling in the store itself, and we were there in June, and I said, "How do you do this? You know, what what temperature is it in here? Oh, you know, 63, 64, whatever, you know." So they're, they're drying at 63, 64 degrees. Um, in Chicago, I, I'm not convinced that the inspectors would even allow something like I saw on Arthur Avenue in the Bronx. I mean, everything was just out in the open, non-controlled, right in the deli itself hanging there. And so when they, when they made them like this, the Supersatas, and they, they hung them as far away from the deli counter as possible, but they were all loaded all the way to the deli counter. So every week as they would make more, they would bring them over to here and they would move that row up. And then they would bring in more, make more, and move the row up, okay? And and it would take them, they said, anywhere from eight to 10 weeks to make Super Santa. And by that time, that row was right over the deli counter. And so they had round, mild, round, hot, round, triple hot, they had flat, mild, flat, hot, and flat, triple hot. So they had six different versions hanging on the ceiling. And when you went there, you said, okay, give me a flat, hot, and a flat, mild, or whatever. And the guys behind the counter didn't even have to come around the counter. They would just grab a knife, and they would cut one right off the ceiling, right, the one that, that, that's right over at the counter. And, and as they were selling these, they were just gradually shifting them. And, and what's funny is, you know, everybody's so worried and, you know, kind of goes goofy when they, when you talk about molds and stuff like that. And if you saw the colors on those things, you wouldn't believe it. Okay, so, and I've never been to Italy, but I was told that when you go there, everything is white. Um, even you know, if they're on the sidewalks, they're on the sidewalks in 70 and 80 degree weather, and they're just they're coated in white. They're coated in white mold. Mold is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, but uh, but in, in, in America, people get paranoid and goofy when they see molds. Um, and, and trust me, three years ago when I started this, four years ago, you know, I was kind of like, oh, this is kind of weird. But then when I see, you know, what's, what's actually being hung in Parma uh, for prosciuttos and stuff like that, I mean, man, they're, they're green. So I'm not supposed to tell you that, but yeah, they're green, they're white, they're brown. I mean, they're every possible color you can imagine. And a lot of those molds sometimes actually do bring flavors through, especially on a prosciutto that doesn't get packed in a casing. Uh, it's, it's hung. Um, and so that, that definitely brings the flavor right straight into the meat. So we are done. I'm going to stop from going live, but this is the finished product. 1,805 grams. And I have eight more to go. So uh, thanks for visiting. And... Um, 
I will maybe post the video when this guy's done, or maybe what I'll do is I'll uh, in in this thread um, I will add some photos of of them hanging in the chamber and take some photos of the chamber uh, after I'm done, so I don't have to move the camera around. See you later. Okay, so this is the curing chamber, and we have about uh, uh, 30 or 45 pounds uh, of super sata on this side, and that's the uh, white mold that I was talking about and uh, I have the chamber open right now but you'll see that we're running 51 degrees and it's saying 81% uh, humidity right now because I have the door open and the compressor just kicked on so this will go down to about 49 and then shut down and then these are the uh, cup of colas that we just made there's nine of them and you'll see that the refrigerator is roughly 25 or 30 inches deep I got nine of them in there. There we go. And they're anywhere from uh, 12, 1,200 grams on the low end to about uh, 1,800 grams on the high end. And uh, they're they're pretty wet, so they are. I do have a drip tray down on the bottom, and they are dripping. I'm going to throw uh, some towels down there just to collect some of that moisture. That'll probably stop within the next day or two. So that's about it. They're all tagged and ready to go. And it shows that uh, I coated this with uh, red pepper uh, during the cure. And then before I put it in the beef bung, I coated it with another red pepper. And they all have wine on uh, June 30th, and this is 1,625 grams. So that's about it.